All right, Eric. Yes. Eric, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from? I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I've been here practically my whole life. And tell me about your family. Um, I was born uh, in a wealthy family. I come from a wealthy family. My mother, she was born and raised in New Orleans, and um, her father was an oil man. And um, he struck oil in Texas, I think, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. And um, she had a very good childhood, um, went to private schools her whole life, grew up across the street from uh, Archie Payton and Eli Manning in the uh, Garden District. Um, basically, uh, she's a professional tennis player. You know, I had a pretty good childhood, so to speak. But you got in trouble? Yes, I had gotten in trouble. Um, a lot throughout my life. Uh, the first time when I was 17, I was arrested for obstruction of justice, um, possession of ecstasy, and uh, drunk and disorderly con conduct in a French Quarter. Um, I had gotten in big trouble in 2018. Um, one of my buddies had called me when I was on my way to work and um, I was doing a painting job by the Magnolia Projects. And um, he had called me while I was on my way to work and he said, hey, I need a ride. So I was like, man, I'm on my way to work. I said, I really don't have time. Well, at that time I was strung out on heroin, probably had a gram a day heroin habit, $100 a day. And um, he said, I said, I'm on my way to work. And he was like, man, I have an eight ball of heroin. Come pick me up, you know, I'll get you loaded. Well, I said, okay, I'll call my boss and tell him I'll be a few minutes late. So he told me to pick him up at Walmart in Kenner. When I went, Kenner is on the outskirts of New Orleans, probably about 15, 20 minutes away. So when I went and picked him up at Walmart, he had gotten into my car with a book bag and a pistol. So at that time, my heart started <laughs> pounding a mile a minute. And I asked him, what's going on? He said, Man, if the police get behind us, just know I'm throwing down with them. And uh, basically, I'm not going down. They're going to have to kill me. So I'm like, dude, what is going on? You know? And he said, uh, you haven't watched the news? I'm like, dude, what is, what's going on, man? And uh, he said, I robbed the bank yesterday. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Well, anyways, uh... I said, look, man, I got to go to work. Where do you need to get dropped off at? So uh, he said, drop me off at Church's Chicken on Claiborne. So I brought him there and um, he had gotten me high and uh, gave me a hundred dollar bill and said, look, um, what time do you get off work? And I had told him, uh, I'd say four or five o'clock. He said, when you get off, give me a call. And um, if you can give me a ride somewhere, you know, I'll compensate you. So I said, okay. Well, I went to work, didn't think much of it. As I'm getting off of work, I really, you know, I, I had the hundred dollars he had given me that morning, but, um, you know, I could, I was thinking I could sure use the money at that time, especially with my habit. So I call him, I said, where do you need to go? He said, uh, can you bring me to Baton Rouge? I'm, uh, I'm gonna catch a bus. So I said, okay. I said, uh, you know, I asked him, what exactly did you do, man? And he said, I went into the Gulf Coast Bank on Veterans Boulevard and uh, I walked in. I raised a pistol to two tellers and said, both of y'all empty the drawers or we're going to have all of us are going to have a really bad day. So he arm robbed the bank. Uh, he had just gotten out of federal prison from doing 27 years in federal prison and gotten relapsed, gotten back on drugs, and that's pretty much what uh, led him to do something that crazy. But um, I gave him a ride to Baton Rouge, and um, he, he didn't have an ID. He said, man, can you rent a hotel room for me? I said, sure, I'll do it. You know, I did it for him. We went to his room, we got high, and uh, he gave me $300. And that was the last time I've ever seen him. I went about my business. And uh, the next day is where everything pretty much, you know, everything started collapsing in my life. What happened then? 
Um, I, I went to work, like nothing happened. It was a pretty good day. I got off of work, uh, went inside and my girlfriend, who's my wife now, at the time she was my girlfriend, I had went inside, we were talking, you know, and uh, I was like, babe, I'm going to clean my paintbrushes. Would you like to come, you know, talk to me while I do it? And she said, sure, I'll come talk to you. So I had my back facing the street and I was clean. My uh, water service is right by my front door in my old apartment. And I had my back facing the street. And um, I'm sitting there cleaning my paintbrushes and she's looking at me, but she's facing in the direction of the street so she can see cars coming and going and whatnot. So um, she's standing there and all of a sudden I see a, a look on her face. Her eyes got huge and she's like, what is going on right now? And I looked over my shoulder and here comes Suburbans, all kind of unmarked cars jumping out with in suits with badges around their neck. And uh, instantly I, you know, effed and went to go run inside because I had drugs in my pocket. I had cocaine, marijuana, and a few bags of heroin in my pocket. And as soon as I went to go inside, she said, stop, don't run. By this time, they got their guns out saying, stop, stop, you know? So I just stood there and uh, the first guy ran with a gun in my face. He says, why are you trying to run? Why are you trying to run? I said, I didn't know who y'all were, you know? So by this time, about eight officers come over here and they're like, where is he? Where's Andy? Where's Andy? I said, man, I don't know where Andy is, you know? So the first cop says, search him. So they search me. He said, man, why were you trying to go inside? I said, to be honest with you, I have weed on me. He said, um, okay, where is it? I said, it's in my right pocket. So he cuffed me, he starts patting my pockets, he pulls a bag of weed out. I was like, okay, I'm good. They didn't find the crack or the heroin. So he pats me down, I think I'm good. They sit me on the ground. And they, uh, they asked my girlfriend if they could go in the house and look around. So they're looking around for this bank robber and um, they don't find him, they clear the house. Well, another cop walks up and says, man, search him one more time and then that's when they did a thorough search and I looked down and the heroin and crack, they were balled up in a toilet paper. I see it fall on the ground and I tried to step on it. And that's when he's like, nice try buddy, lift your foot up. And then the jig was up, they had found it. And basically, um, yeah. You went to uh, prison? Uh, I went to Jefferson Parish Correctional Center and um, I had went there and uh, they booked me on uh, accessory to armed robbery and uh, possession of heroin. And they had booked me on uh, possession of Schedule II crack cocaine. And um, my bond was $40,000. And uh, after a few weeks, I had posted bail. My girlfriend had posted bail for me. How much time did you do? Um, on that, I was sentenced to drug court. But prior to this, uh, about a year prior to this, I had just gotten out of prison for doing four years. Four years and one week I had did in uh, prisons all around Louisiana. Are you the only one in your family? Uh, yes, I'm the black sheep of my family. Why do you think that is? Honestly, if I, probably, probably my, uh, my upbringing, guidance. I didn't really have that in my life. Structure, I didn't. You have siblings? Uh, yes, I have one sister and I have a half brother. Did they have similar childhoods? Uh, yes, my sister and I grew up in the same household and uh, my half brother, I don't really know too much about his childhood other than we have the same dad and he wasn't around for either of our lives. So, but uh, my sister and I grew up in the same household and uh, yeah, her and I are polar opposite, you know. But you're doing better now. Yes, I'm doing better. I'm on maintenance. I've got a steady job. I've been doing plumbing work pretty much um, since I got on that program after being arrested in connection with the bank robbery. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a struggle though, you know. Um, I have a son. Um, 
he was diagnosed about nine months ago with autism. And uh, when I found that out, we wanted to get him tested because he was showing signs about two years old. I started to notice things and, um, you know, just was like concerned. So, you know, I started talking to somebody and they told me, you know, that sounds a little bit like autism. And I was like, autism, you know, I really didn't know too much about it. And I started, you know, doing research and stuff. And I was like, you know, I really pray that it's not autism, but all signs were pointing towards it. And uh, we had got him tested and yep, I found out he had autism and it kind of broke me, I'm not gonna lie. I was in a dark place, you know, for a few months because of it and it, it really weighed down on me. And um, everything's getting better now. I'm starting to accept it and just trying to move forward and be the best version of myself that I can be for him. Is there any temptation to go back to your previous life? Um, as far as criminal, like um, doing illegal stuff for money, like uh, the stuff that had landed me in prison for four years and uh, the stuff that I did that I almost got a life sentence behind or football numbers behind, uh, absolutely not. But, you know, probably if I didn't have uh, job skills now, like a uh, tradesman, who knows where I would be, you know? But uh, once I started learning the skill, I started, you know, being able to make, support my habit by working. You know, I uh, think think twice about doing something that's gonna put me back in prison, probably because of my son. I think about him and my wife first, and uh, I know if I go back to prison, I'm gonna lose everybody in my life. And you know, it wouldn't be the first time that I've lost everything. And now I've just came to a point where I'm like, you know, I'm tired of lying to my wife. I'm tired of hurting the people I care about. You know, she's found me overdosed before. You know, and it was really a scary situation for somebody who doesn't do drugs or was never involved with a person who's from the streets or, you know, been to prison or, you know. So all of that, I basically exposed her to all of that, you know. And I feel guilty a lot about it. I feel guilty a lot about it. And, um, you know, sometimes I wish that I could do things a little bit differently, but... Basically, I know all I can do is try to live better and try to do better moving forward. But it's a struggle, you know? Or would you say you're more hopeful now or more fearful? Um, Both, kind of, honestly. You know, I, uh, I'm, like with the trade I'm learning, uh, plumbing, you know, I had no job skills my whole life. I basically was working bullshit jobs or pretty much wherever, whoever would give me a job. And a lot of the times with my record, it was hard to get a job anywhere, you know? So I'd basically take whatever I could. And a guy gave me a chance with plumbing and uh, I took it and ran with it. And once I started learning, I saw the type of money I could be making. And, you know, it felt good to actually know how to do something, you know? And um, because my whole life, I never really had, you know, any type of hobbies, skills, um, yeah, pretty much never had an opportunity like that, you know, to learn and better myself. So when I had gotten that opportunity, I took it and ran with it. What fears do you have? Honestly, the fears that I have is um, just falling back into my old ways as far as like just being headfirst in active addiction, you know, disappearing. Um, Staying high, losing my job, um, losing my son and my wife, that would, I would be devastated, you know? But um, I really don't want to go back, back to my old life. Are there addicts in your family? Yes. My mother, she, um, she died in 2000, January 13, 2007. Um, my sister found her dead. She had overdosed on, um, well, she was dead with her eyes open in bed. And, um, you know, they called an ambulance and I was at my friend's house drinking and uh, taking Xanax and stuff. And I had went over there because I had seen a police car and an ambulance. So I'm like, what's going on? I walk in a house and I seen uh, the man who raised me, David, he's a British man. 
and uh, he was crying, and I've never seen that man shed a tear a day in my life, and he was crying, and I look up, and I seen a police officer walking down the stairs, and I said, what's going on? And my sister looked at me and said, she's gone. And I said, what do you mean? And my dad said, well, my stepdad, he said, she's dead. And I tried to go upstairs and, you know, see, and the cop was basically being a dick to me, like pushing me back, saying, you can't go up there, you can't go up there. And I started acting irrational and stuff and uh, just was hysterical, you know? And um, he was like, you can't go up there. And I was just like, you know, acting belligerent. He's like, you keep it up, I'm going to detain you. And uh, I went and sat outside and went back to my friend's house and basically uh, drunk myself to oblivion, you know? And just um, that night I lost probably one of the only people I ever felt that loved me before my wife and my son, you know? You know, that was devastating because I felt alone after that. I felt like I didn't have anybody. Really and truly, I didn't have anybody after that happened, you know? And it was very, um, it's been a very heartbreaking journey since that day. It sounds like your wife has been very supportive, though. Yeah, she's a great woman. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm just so blessed to have somebody like that in my life. I honestly, a lot of the times I feel like I don't deserve it, you know? Or I feel like I'm not worthy. That's a huge part of it. You know, I, I feel like that all the time, man. You know, I feel like a junkie. You know, I feel like, you know, like I'm a criminal. Like, you know, I just, um, I don't know. I just feel like uh, she could do better than me, you know? But... It's, it's hard. I live with a lot of guilt and shame and uh, I just wish that um, I could do things, would have done things different. But a part of me, I think every day, like, I'm kind of glad that, you know, I made these mistakes because this is what led me to the family that I have now. And I'm thankful for them, you know, every day. That's probably the most important thing in my life. But I think working on how you see yourself, like if you see yourself as a drug addict, criminal, you know, it's somebody it, who's got, you know, just hanging on by a thread, you need to see yourself as somebody who's worthy of the love of your wife. Absolutely, you know, and she, um, like she don't see me as any of that, you know, and um, she's very supportive, you know, she always just tries to, you know, get me to be responsible and just do the right thing. All the time she tells me like, I'll bring something up, you know, like maybe a dumb idea to, you know, maybe get money in an easy way. And she's like, no, you're not gonna do that. You're gonna, you know, do it the right way. You don't wanna have to worry about looking in your rearview mirror or your door coming down, you know? Like I've had that happen to me several times because of, you know, dealing drugs or just running from the police, you know, evading arrest and capture. And it's just, she's definitely been a, a great influence in my life. And uh, I'm very thankful to have her. What would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? The most important lesson that I've learned in life is to just work hard and be an honest person and, you know, just be good to people. Even if being good to people, you know, gets, gets a knife in your back or, you know, you get betrayed, don't stop being good. Just learn how to learn the type of people to be good to, you know. So um, that's basically it as far as, you know, the biggest lesson I've learned in life. Excellent. All right, Eric, thank you so much for sharing your story. Not a problem, Mark. Thank we you for having me. wish you and your family lots of luck from here. Thank you. Thanks.